Hello, and thank you for joining us for our three-part webinar series, Earth Observations Toolkit for Sustainable Cities and Human Settlements. Today, we have part two of our training on applications of the EO Toolkit to measure and analyze sustainable development goals. Once again, my name is Ergiro Cavada, and I'm the Program Manager for Sustainable Development Goals at NASA Earth Science Division Applied Sciences Program. This three-part training is a collaboration between NASA's Applied Remote Sensing Training Program, the UN Habitat, the Group on Earth Observations EO4SDG Initiative, the GeoHuman Planet Initiative, and the CEOs Working Group on Capacity Building and Data Democracy. This training will have three parts, each being one and a half hours long. These sessions will consist of lectures and demonstrations, each followed by a question and answer session. You can find all the course materials on the website listed here, and after each part, the recording can be found here too. There are two prerequisites for this training. First, you must have an understanding of the basics of remote sensing with our course on those concepts listed here if you're not familiar. Also, it is recommended that you have attended or watched the materials from the training we held last spring on an introduction to population grids and their integration with remote sensing data for sustainable development and disaster management. This training will be delivered in English and Spanish, so if you're more comfortable attending the Spanish version, we will conduct that session later today and you can find the registration link through the link found in the chat. For this series, we will have one homework assignment. The link to the homework will be made available during the last session and will be due on Tuesday, February 24th. The homework will be a Google form that you submit online. If you attend all three parts and complete the homework by the deadline, you will receive a certificate of completion. Please be patient as it takes a couple of months to process and send out these certificates. The objectives for this training series are to understand the value and usefulness of Earth observations to monitor and report on urban sustainable development goal indicators and the new urban agenda, learn from inspiring examples of cities using Earth observations for SDG 11 and the new urban agenda, Understand how to apply Earth Observation-based toolkit resources to enhance urban resilience and improve decisions regarding planning, monitoring, and operational preparedness. For example, including informal settlements, open spaces for public use, access to public transport, and urban greening monitoring such as for air quality or land consumption, and operational preparedness, including, for example, for emergency response to different types of hazards. As I mentioned, this series consists of three parts. Today, during part two, we will cover applications of the EO Toolkit to measure and analyze sustainable development goals, including the degree of urbanization tools and SDG 11 indicators, demonstration of the pop grid website and viewer, evaluation of the accuracy of gridded population data sets for SDG 11.1.1 on adequate housing, and demonstration of the pop grid uh, for data set comparison for SDG 11.5.1 on people directly affected by disasters. And for our last part, part three, on February 10th, we will go through a couple of use cases from the national and city level. And so now I would like to introduce our colleagues, Thomas Kemper, project leader from the European Commission's Joint Research Center, and Cascade Tacholsky, postdoctoral research scientist at the Center for International Earth Science Information Network at Columbia University. First, we will go to Thomas. Thomas, over to you. Welcome to this course that will introduce the degree of urbanization. The degree of urbanization is the method enabling the classification of a territory by human settlement types, such as cities, 
towns and villages. This classification can support the reporting of progress in achieving the sustainable development goals. The team of the global human settlement layer develop data and tools that enable mapping and analyzing the degree of urbanization worldwide. All tools and data sets are available also in the Earth Observation Toolkit. My name is Thomas Kemper and I'm leading the GHSL project at the European Commission Joint Research Center. I have a wide experience in remote sensing for the detection and characterization of settlements in support to EU policies. In this course, you will learn how to use your own data in simple software tools to assess the degree of urbanization and employ this definition for policy purposes in comparison based on a standard definition. First, we will introduce the policy context linking urbanization with sustainability. Then we will introduce the degree of urbanization method and see how it served the production of global online open data available to your analysis purposes. We will also cover the usage of our free tool suite that allows applying the degree of urbanization to custom data. More significantly, we will see how classified settlements issued as output of such tools can be matched with other data of your interest, making few examples. We will focus in particular on SDG 11, but explore the application also to other SDGs and to national statistics as well. At the end of the presentation, find the links to our support material if you want to go deeper. Human activities take place on the Earth's surface, our home and workplace. The settlements where we live and work are at the center of the many challenges we collectively face that prompted the adoption of several international agendas for development and sustainability, such as the Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development, the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, and the new Urban Agenda. Monitoring progress towards the Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, is based on metrics called indicators that tell us how far we are from reaching the targets. Computing these indicators requires harmonized definitions of what we are measuring and data to measure. Cities and human settlements are still growing, and it is certain that most of the challenges faced by humankind will happen there. According to the United Nations, more than half of global population today lives in urban areas, and it is expected to increase even more. However, these figures are based purely on very different national definitions to count urban and rural population. The way urban and rural areas are defined influences how urban and rural population is accounted. In this map, you see the diversity of definitions used by national statistical offices of different countries to report to the United Nations. Most of them, in the lightest shades, are based on different population size or density thresholds, sometimes in combination with other indicators. However, you see many countries in darker colors which adopt different methods or do not adopt a statistical definition, but rely, for example, on administrative breakdowns. Such situation does not favor an internationally uniform way to report the progress towards the sustainable development goals, which are monitored through indicators collected for urban and rural areas. Agreeing on a common method to identify what a city or a town is, where it begins and where it ends, and what is rural is key to ensure whether we monitor the evolution of urbanization worldwide. This is essential to identify best practices and improvements in policy making. This is the reason why several international institutions agreed to develop the degree of urbanization method as an entrusted and reliable international standard. Using GHSL global data sets as a reference data, six international institutions developed the degree of urbanization together and presented the methodology to the UN Statistical Commission, which endorsed it officially in 2020. 
Currently, several custodian agencies of the Sustainable Development Goals recommended the use of the degree of urbanization to facilitate international comparisons, reporting of urbanization statistics, and calculation of indicators. This new method has several benefits. It can be applied in a very cost-effective manner. Existing data collection, such as, such as household surveys, can often be used as an input to the degree of urbanization. By proposing three classes, it captures the urban-rural types range. Because this method is based on a population grid, it reduces the distortions created by a variable size of statistical and administrative units. It improves global comparability by capturing the spatial concentration of people directly instead of relying on proxies such as built-up areas or night lights. But, not, not la but last not least, the method is independent from the presence of amenities as it was designed to monitor access to services and, and infrastructures in areas with different population densities and sizes. The degree of urbanization workflow starts from a population census as input, which details the number of inhabitants per census unit. Census units are usually administrative or statistical subdivisions of the territory of inter interest stored as polygons in a vector dataset like a shapefile. The population must be an attribute of, of each census unit for the degree of urbanization to work. In some cases, Population counts may refer to household point locations forming geocodes or population registers. The population within a census unit is distributed or aggregated on a grid made of squared cells, typically one kilometer large, that covers the extent of all census units. The methods enable classifying cells by degree of urbanization according to their population density and size. The degree of urbanization is then traced back to the initial territorial units based on the grid level classification. The Global Human Settlement Layer team applies this method on a global scale and in various epochs to obtain chronological worldwide coverage of the degree of urbanization. To do so, it starts from global satellite imagery and uses artificial intelligence to mark down built up surface. Census data on population is available from the official state-level surveying campaigns for given administrative boundaries, harmonized by researchers at the Center for International Earth Science Information Network, CSINs, in the United States. This population is allocated to grid cells in proportion to their share of built-up area. Population density, amount and distribution are the basic criteria to subdivide the territory into settlement classes by degree of urbanization. The result of such work is a, is a set of free and open data with global coverage that you can look at and download online. In particular, in particular such data can be useful to support your calculation or to cross-check and compare your results against a consolidated data set. At this link, you will find the built-up surface under the GHS build abbreviation the population grid based on CSIN data as GHS POP and the respective settlement classification grid as GHS SMOD and the classification of global administrative areas GHS DAC. In addition, you will find all derived data sets such as the Urban Center Database, the UCDP and the Functional Urban Areas GHS FUA. The GHSL team produces different maps of built-up for different applications. The GHS build is the most used built-up product. In its latest, latest release, it covers the entire world with images taken in 2018, having a resolution of 10 meters. The main product part of GHS build is the built-up fraction, which reports the share of built-up surface per each 10 meter grid cells in 2018 on a scale from 0 to 1. As byproduct, the morphological classification is a 10 meter raster that offers the subdivision of built up into residential and non residential categories, plus some vegetation categories. In addition, the multi temporal rasters record 
the epoch during which built-up surface was first detected in each 10-meter grid cell. Other built-up fraction layers are available for older epochs, but are only in aggregated format at coarser resolutions like 100 meters or one kilometer. For the application of the degree of urbanization, it is best to choose the built-up data set with the highest resolution matching the most recent available census data. Now that you have seen an overview of the degree of urbanization method, you are certainly wondering how it can be applied to your own data. The GHSL team has designed a set of tools to accompany each phase of the calculation process. In particular, the POP2G tool helps you in distributing population data from census units to a population grid. In case you have your own population grid already, which is projected according to your national standards, the pop to warp tool can help you. It will translate the grid to a worldwide mall-wide projection, which is the one used within the degree of urbanization framework for international comparisons without going through bulky resampling operations. The DAC tool allows converting the population grid to a settlement grid by classifying grid cells according to population, density and size to achieve the stage one of the degree of urbanization. Finally, the DUTUK tool uses such classified grids to assign a degree of urbanization to the initial territorial units, holding census information, completing the stage two of the degree of urbanization. Let's now see together how each tool works in more detail. We start with the POP2G tool to create population grids for the degree of urbanization. The POP2G tool requires two inputs, a sensor or vector map of the area of, of uh, interest, typically a polygon shape, and a built-up surface raster relative to the same area of interest. You will have to provide the first one containing the population counts for all units in the area of interest. The second one, if not produced specifically for the area of interest, is available from the GHSL web portal. When census data is, is a collection of household points, a built-up surface is not necessary. In case of a census based on administrative units, the POP2G tool will match the registered population with the territorial distribution of the built-up surface. This process produces a one kilometer resolution grid in an equal area projection, compliant with international standards and other fine, finer scale grids whenever possible. The cell size of the output population grid should not be smaller than the one in the input built-up layer, as this would not add any detail. In case of the census based on ge geocoded points, the tool will perform the aggregation of points to create a raster grid at the necessary resolution of one kilometer. The logic behind this procedure is the preservation of the total population vo volume to comply with the original census. The degree of urbanization is a method to capture the full spectrum of settlements from the hamlet to the megacity and consists of two levels. The first and main level divides the territory into three classes, urban centers, urban clusters, and rural grid cells. As such, while most of the national standards are based on a binary definition of either rural or urban territory, the degree of urbanization introduces a third intermediate class. Urban areas are defined as urban centers plus urban clusters. However, the use of all three classes helps to capture more details because urban clusters differ significantly from both urban centers and rural grid cells. A second level provides more detail by splitting urban clusters into dense and semi-dense plus suburban and peri-urban grid cells. Rural grid cells are split into rural clusters, low and very low density rural grid cells. If you are wondering how all these data sets and settlement types look like, in this slide you have an example from satellite imagery. This only gives the flavor of the most evident differences between classes. 
for example, see the decreasing de concentration of people from the urban center grid cell to the suburban grid in the urban area. Among rural areas, you can identify the isolated settlement in the rural cluster grid cell and scattered distribution in low density rural grid cells and the remoteness of very low density rural grid cells. Talking practically, what you will need to run the degree of urbanization grid tool DAC is again the population grid as issued from the POP2G tool and the built up grid with the same resolution and the same extent. The built up grid is needed only if the 50% built up density option is selected. In case you don't have the version of this data set, you can always download it from the GHSL portal. Another input that can be useful, useful is the land grid. It is a continuous raster holding values in a range from zero for water to 100 for landmass issued from land pixel aggregation. A default version of this raster is preloaded in the tool, but at best you can provide your own in case available. In short, the tool will analyze the population grid and build up input to take care of, the classif of classifying all the raster cells based on population size and density criteria. Here you see an example of a real case scenario, namely the classification of the city of Cork in Ireland. You can see how the urban centre is rather compact in spite of the conspicuous spread of the population and how a system of satellite urban clusters emerges from large rural hinterland. Now we want to trace the degree of urbanization back to the territorial unions. Let's see what those are in an example. This is the French region of Corsica, split hierarchically into several territories corresponding to given administrative competences. All such levels could be used as source of territorial units as they include, include close defined boundaries. Administrative boundaries at various levels are available for free for non-commercial users from the database of global administrative areas linked here, here, which covers the entire world. However, territorial units are not constrained to, to be administrative boundaries. They could also be statistical units used for censuses, like the CRN lines you see here on the Corsica map, or postal code areas, or any other exhaustive and coherent subdivision of geographic space. The general recommendation is to use the smallest spatial units for which regular data can be produced to compile statistics by degree of urbanization. Along with the vector of the territorial units, there is other necessary input to the degree of urbanization territorial units classifier, the DU took. One is the population grid and the other the degree of urbanization grid produced earlier. To facilitate the classification process, the degree of urbanization grid should be at the standard resolution of one square kilometer. Once the computation is launched, the software will rasterize the territorial unit boundaries and match them with the degree of urbanization grid. Then it will calculate the proportion of the unit's population in each degree of urbanization class or the proportion of unit surface in case there is no population. The algorithm assigns the class that corresponds to a given mix of population or surface within the unit. We could visualize the possible shares of population or surface by degree of urbanization using urbanization classes on a plot. The possible combinations determine the attribution of a certain class to a given unit by majority rules. The first level classification is carried out first, then second level subclasses are attributed in a second phase. Under the first level classification, territorial units are classified as cities if they have at least 50% of the population residing in underlying urban center grid cells. Rural areas come from territor territorial units having more than 50% in rural, rural grid cells within their boundaries. Towns and semi-dense areas result from territorial units having 
less than 50% of population living in urban centers and no more than 50% of population living in rural grid cells, irrespectively from the population in urban, cent urban cluster grid cells. The same logic can be applied to surface in unpopulated areas. Under the second level classification, the first level class is split based on relative majority of inhabitants. The assigned class corresponds to, one, to the one with the highest share of population. A particular case occurs in towns and semi-dense areas when a first comparison is performed between total population living in dense or semi-dense urban clusters and population living in suburban and peri-urban grid cells. A territorial unit is classified as suburban or peri-urban if the population living in such class is at least 50% within urban clusters. Conversely, the unit is classified as dense if the relative population is greater or equal to the one in semi-dense urban clusters or vice versa. By looking at the example of the city of Cork and Ireland again, you can see how the urban center matches the respective territorial unit pretty well, but suburban polygons appear much larger compared to the extent of the underlying grid cells classified accordingly. This is a consequence of their size in relation to the population distribution. The degree of urbanization grids can be easily overlaid in other raster datasets like gridded air pollutant emission datasets. This way, researchers can perform spatial statistics of different kind. In this work, carbon dioxide em emissions observed in various geographic areas of the planet are broken down by degree of urbanization class. No wonder that urban centers are the ones that increased more drastically their emission between 1970 and 2015, with the exception of Europe. Similar, similar zonal statistics can be done on nighttime lights by degree of urbanization to identify inequalities. With regard to the Sustainable Cities and Communities SDG Goal 11, GHSL data classified through the degree of urbanization are allowed to estimate the indicator 1131 called land use efficiency. This indicator assesses the ratio between the rain rate and built up area divided by the, the change rate in population across time epochs on a logarithmic scale. The degree of urbanization is fundamental to delineate urban areas as the areas of interest. As such, settlements where population growth rate is greater than the pace of built up area expansion lie in the range between zero and one. Settlements in the class are respectively urban centers in Africa. Settlements with values outside the 0-1 range indicate faster built-up area expansion compared to population change, like in Europe and Asia. Sometimes the ratio is negative, meaning continuous built-up area expansion and population decline. This trajectory is typical for Eastern Europe and Japan and parts of uh, central China. Urban centers have the most efficient trajectory both in towns and semi-dense areas, as well as in rural areas. Built-up surfaces expand at a faster rate compared to the rate of their population growth. Another, beyond population change and built-up change, urban centers from a grid-based degree of urbanization classification can be crossed with continuous exposure data on certain characters, categories of disaster risk. Here you see the risk categories for a seismic hazard calculated in each urban centers. Once exposed settlements are identified, population and built up area exposure statistics can be calculated. For example, based on the GHSL data, we estimate that the large cities of the developing world exposed to earthquakes are growing faster than global average posing challenges to resilient urban futures. Another typical continuous variable is, is the frequently used uh, temperature. In this plot, you see the temperature changes in urban centers since 1990, with clear peaks in Eastern Europe and the Middle East. 
At global level, more than 400 million people live in urban centers that experience the temperature change of more than 0 0.8 degrees Celsius between 1990 and 2015. Such changes affect large populations and pose considerable stress to the health uh, systems. Delineation of urban centers is useful for combining other data from satellite sources like the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, also known as NDVI, to monitor greenness. For example, SDG 1162 aims to quantify green open spaces accessible by inhabitants. An overall trend is increased of in green, in increased greenness between 1990 and 2014 is observed in most urban centers across the world. The effect of greenness, greening is found also for most of the 32 world megacities. Nature-based solution and ecological renovation can help urban centers coping with climate change and build resilience. Now let's have a look at the application of the degree of urbanization for, mo for monitoring and assessing the sustainable development goals, combining, combining it with official statistics. The classification of settlements can be matched with living condition surveys to break down well-being indexes by degree of urbanization. In the plot here, we are focusing on access to food and we represent statistics on food insecurity from the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations on territorial subsets for selected countries. Rural areas are often found to be significantly more food insecure than cities but not everywhere. Focusing on, focusing on access to health care in many countries, many countries are covered by the Demographic and Health Service, DHS. Infant mort mortality is notably higher in rural areas than in cities. In a few countries, cities had a higher infant mortality rate, but the difference tended to be smaller. Now let's see the possible application of an effective classification of territorial units. The classification of territorial units by degree of urbanization has two principal objectives. Primarily, to relate available statistics like demographic and health surveys, statistics on labor or housing to a degree of urbanization classification, namely urban or rural. And second, to account urban and rural populations for administrative areas. Both applications would harmonize nationally collected statistics to a common urban-rural classification of territorial units, useful for international statistical comparison as recommended by the United Nations Statistical Commission. For example, the 2018 census of Colombia was used to apply the degree of urbanization and to disaggregate the statistics of services by degree of urbanization like access to electricity, fresh water, and internet connectivity, among others. From our analysis, 97.1% of the households in Colombia have access to fresh water, but this share decreases to 54% when moving from urban to the low-density rural grid cells. SDG reporting becomes easier and more informative with such classification tools. Now it's time to recap. In this presentation, you learn how the degree of urbanization is relevant to sustainable development goals, to assess and monitor key indicators, as well as to envision development policies and strategies. We looked at the global data sets provided freely online for your analysis, and we discovered a common methodology for classifying settlements according to the degree of urbanization, which was endorsed by several international organizations. We explored the free toolkit available to compute the degree of urbanization and how to use it and apply it successfully for policy design. If you need support, remember to check the GHSL website, which contains a set of handy user guides for each of the presented tools, a full manual detailing the methods and the Atlas of the Human Planet series with plenty of application examples with different thematic foci each year. And don't forget to check our online training selection too, which provides more details of the methodology. 
Thank you for listening. Thank you, and thank you everyone for being here today. Uh, my name is Cascade Tucholsky. I'm a postdoctoral research scientist at the Center for International Earth Science Information Network, which is a part of uh, the Columbia Climate School at Columbia University, and I work closely with the Nas uh, NASA Socioeconomic Data and Application Center, uh, one of NASA's DACs, and I'm really excited to be here today to uh, talk about applications of the EO toolkit to measure and analyze sustainable development goals. So as I said, I am a postdoc at CSEN. I'm a human environmental geographer. My research focuses on extreme heat exposure, climate change, and food security, largely outside of the North American and European contexts. My goal as a scientist is to inform adaptation strategies that reduce the harmful and inequitable impacts of extreme heat events. And I received my PhD in geography from the University of California, Santa Barbara in 2020. So in this webinar, I'm going to do an uh, provide an introduction to PopGrid. And if we hold on one moment, I'll explain what PopGrid is. Um, and the importance of comparison of gridded population data sets to the sustainable development goals. Um, I will show how gridded population data sets have been used uh, to evaluate sustainable development goal indicator 11.11 or adequate housing and how earth observation data can be used to inform slum or deprivation areas or deprived habitat housing in urban settlements. I will then um, provide an overview of the PopGrid website and the PopGrid viewer, and then I will briefly demonstrate a new data set that is uh, in alpha release, or it's not formally released by NASA CDAC, but it will be called the PopGrid Compare uh, data set for more advanced users with uh, background in geographic information systems or uh, scripting language like Python or R. So the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals uh, have been talked about extensively throughout these webinars um, are comprehensive. There are 17. The toolkit really focuses on Sustainable Development Goal 11 um, in terms of uh, understanding or pardon me, ensuring more sustainable uh, urban populations across the face of the planet. And with each sustainable, pardon me, with each sustainable development goal, there are target indicator indicators, and for SDG 11, most of the indicators require a population input into the parameter to track whether a country is making project progress towards uh, a specific part of SDG 11. So as you can imagine, it's really important that we have the best available data for urban population distributions, as well as the location and boundaries of urban settlements and uh, urban infrastructure. So again, sustainable development goal 11 is to make sure cities and human settlements uh, are inclusive, safe, resilient, and, uh, and sustainable. So today I will present um, efforts to use gridded population data sets to focus on STD target 11.1 and target 11.5 and then for target 11.1, the specific indicator or metric used to track STG 11.1 is 11.11, the proportion of urban populations living in slums, informal settlements, or inadequate housing. So again, as you can imagine, we would need a count of people living in informal settlements or slums across the face of the planet for us to be able to track this indicator to achieve the target 11.1. Uh, Second, I will discuss um, how gridded population data sets can be used for target 11.5. Uh, the target 11.5 is by 2030 significantly reduce the number of deaths and the number of people affected and pardon me, substantially decrease the direct economic loss relative to global gross domestic product caused by disasters, including weather related disasters with a focus on protecting the poor and people in vulnerable situations. So in sum, 
or in short, SDG 11.5 is really to reduce the number of people who are harmed by disaster events. Sustainable, uh, pardon me, gridded, document, gridded population products can be used uh, to estimate two SDG indicators related to SDG target 11.5. 11, pardon me, indicator 11.51 is the number of deaths, missing person, or directly people, of, pardon me, directly affected persons attributed to disasters per 100,000 people. So for a given disaster event or a given hazard, the goal is to reduce the, nu the number of people impacted relative to the total population. Second target is 11.5.2 focuses on economic loss. So direct e economic loss in relation to global GDP, damage to critical infrastructure, and number of disrupt, uh, disruptions to basic services attributed to disasters. Here, it's really important to have uh, accurate infrastructure data as well as ways to assess economic da damages related to any uh, disaster or uh, hazard. So I know Thomas presented a bit on one gridded population data set, but I'm going to just re-emphasize what gridded population data sets are and walk you through several of the gridded da population data sets produced by different teams across the planet and ways that you can compare those gridded population data sets. So first, again, to review what gridded population data sets are, Essentially, it is a lattice or a grid laid over the surface of the planet, and then each cell in the grid gets a population count. There are several gridded population data sets in existence, and several products identify urban versus rural settlement types. This screenshot right here is from the PopGrid data viewer, viewer with the URL below. I will provide uh, a demonstration of the PopGrid data viewer in a moment. And as you can see, there are four different gridded population data sets on the web page um, in this example. The gridded population of the, of the world version 4, World Pop 2020, LandScan 2018, and the high resolution settlement layer 2015 count. As you can see for this geography, the number of people living in each grid cell varies quite substantially across these four gridded population data sets. This is because each populate, gridded population data set generally uses a different modeling approach. So I am going to walk through two general approaches used by different teams who create gridded population data. But again, remember, gridded population data are a lattice or grid, and each grid cell is assigned a population. Those population estimates are derived by combining remote sensed Earth observation satellite data and sometimes GIS data to develop a relationship between census-derived population counts and remote sense information, and then computer algorithms are used to allocate populations based on that relationship in areas where we might have Earth observation data, but not good census information. As I said, there are two general approach in terms of measuring sustainable, or pardon me, in terms of measuring gridded population data estimates. There is a top-down approach and a bottom-up approach. The top-down approach uses a large area. So for example, in the United States, we might have a large census area count for say a state. And then we use earth observation data to identify everywhere within that large census area estimation that we think people exist. Then a computer algorithm proportionally allocates people to grid cells within that large area to derive the location and the population counts within it, the settlement grid. The bottom-up approach uses high-resolution microcensuses to get a good estimate of a small geographic area. Similarly, computer algorithms derive the relationship between that small area and Earth observation and sometimes GIS information to then go out and tessellate populations or estimate populations outside of that census area based on the relationship between the Earth observational data and the high resolution census. 
both these approaches have their advantages and their disadvantages, and data sets uh, that use these approach can be used to estimate the proportion of people living in slums and fordal sediments or in inadequate housing related to tracking sustainable development goal 11.1.1. But as I mentioned, because these gridded population data sets use different modeling approaches, they estimate where people live uh, differently or they map where people live in different ways. So right here we have a map from a paper I published in sustainability recently of Nepal. The colors indicate whether or not a gridded population data sets a data set agree if a given pixel is habited or not. So dark blue pixels, all five gridded population data sets used in this analysis agree that that pixel has at least one or more person living in it. As you can tell, especially in rural areas and as you approach the Himalaya mountain range in northern Nepal, the there is disagreement about whether a gridded population data whether the gridded population data sets agree if a pixel is inhabited or not. In terms of mapping SDG 11.1.1, a recent paper by my colleague Dana Thompson uh, used different gridded population data sets, in this case nine of them, to measure the number of people living in slum slums or informal settlements settlements across nine areas, uh, two in Nigeria and I believe one in Kenya, and they found that no matter which gridded population data set employed, these gridded population data sets greatly underestimate the number of people living in informal settlements in the three case studies. The high resolution settlement layer tend to capture more population. You can see here that the coarse grain data sets where the pixels are only available say at one kilometer like LandScan, which is the cell in the middle or which is the uh, panel in the middle of this plot, tend to just assign one big population count for a very small area and thus may not be appropriate to try to estimate slum areas uh, necessary for sustainable development goal 11.1. Whereas finer resolution data sets like HRSL may be more appropriate to track SCG 11.1.1 because they have the fine resolution allocation of population uh, to capture the spatial variation of human population within a city or informal settlements. Similarly, if we apply this, uh, compare the estimates of gridded population data sets for 11.5.1, or our efforts to reduce the number of deaths uh, or missing person directly affected uh, by a disaster scenario, the popu gridded population data sets vary fairly substantially. This example again is from Nepal and the earthquake uh, that struck Nepal in 2015. When we sum up the number of people impacted by the intensity of the earthquake, we get fairly substantially different population data set or population estimates. So right here we have a graph divided by uh, intensity where we sum up the number of people impacted for five different gridded population data sets and then we assign whether those populations were rural or urban based on auxiliary remote sense information and you can see a fair amount of variation. This is really important not just for tracking SDG 11.5.1, but also disaster risk reduction and rapid response because practitioners need accurate or at least estimations uh, of the number of people impacted by a hazard and having a range can help facilitate decision makers, help decision makers understand what kind of resources needed to be deployed in a rapid response scenario like the 2015 earthquake. I've overviewed how there are wide ranging uh, population, pardon me, there are several gridded population data sets for practitioners to use, and that these data sets often provide different population estimates related to the sustainable development goals. Nonetheless, all of these data sets are very useful, and the scholars and scientists who have built these data sets have come together to work collaboratively on the PopGrid Data Collaborative, which provides an overview of the modeling techniques, the input data, as well as an ability to compare these data sets 
over space and time. This uh, effort has been supported by the Columbia Climate School, NASA, SCSN Trends, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I'm going to now provide a brief tutorial to walk through the PopGrid Data Collaborative website. So if we go to www.popgrid.org, we get the PopGrid Data Collaborative's website. We have a list of the data providers who produce gridded population data sets. You can link to their information. You can learn more about PopGrid, about the events tab. The news often provides frequent updates of new scientific manuscripts and applications of gridded population data. And then the explore data table or the explore data tab is really important for understanding the various gridded population data sets and how they're built. So if you click on the input layers, you'll see the GIS and remote sensor information that goes into building a given gridded population data set. Second, if you click on the PopGrid mapping tool, you will be piped to NASA CDAC's PopGrid viewer. This is, from, this is the screenshot that I had up at the beginning of my presentation. You'll see uh, in the four panel viewer that you're able to fly around the planet and zoom in on different geographies to see how these different uh, gridded population data sets estimate population over the surface of the planet. If you click on a pixel, uh, you will get a population count um, for that value in a gridded viewer. So right there where I clicked on in Afghanistan, GHS says there's no people, WorldPop estimates about 80 people, LandScan says zero, and GPW, uh, estimates 429. GPW, just as a caveat, is the only unmodeled population data set. That means that from a top-down approach, populations are just equally distributed over the finest scale geography. So they don't account for anything like mountain ranges or lake beds, and it's just an equal allocation of population within a given census boundary. If you switch modes, to comparison viewer, the interface will refresh and you can actually um, do area estimates of uh, different, across the different population data sets. Apologies, this takes a minute to load. This help function is really useful to understand how you can do area estimations uh, to count populations across the data sets. So you have how to draw a polygon, how to edit a polygon, how to draw rectangles with little video tutorials, how to edit rectangles, and how to delete them. So I'm going to close this window. Oops, excuse me. I'm going to close this window so you can fly around. You can load different layers. So if I unclick GPW version 4, there's nothing there. Now we have the GHS pop count. And when you're in this mode, you can get an area estimation in real time. This will take a moment to load. We're on the back end. Uh, season servers are counting the number of people in that polygon I just, or that rectangle I just drew. And when this is done loading, we'll be able to see the population counts. Apologies, my internet is slow today. And so you can, uh, similar to that graph I put up for Nepal, you can estimate uh, or get different area estimations of population counts. And then you can export this either as an image or as a CSV file for your analysis needs. Similarly, I'm not going to do this in my demonstration today, but you can upload shape files as long as they're zipped and contain all the auxiliary needed files to uh, produce area estimates. The last thing I'll present today is for more advanced users. Po gridded population data sets 
tend to come with ge different geographic coordination or uh, quarter ge pardon me ge different geographic project projections areas um, and because of that they're sometimes misaligned a new product that season will be releasing is pop grid compare where all the graded population data sets are matched to a common grid for end users to do more advanced uh, calculations or automate um, area estimates. So right now, the yellow areas are just an estimation based on modus of where urban and rural population or settlements exist. But if we click through here, this is global human settlement layer for 2015. The colors are log scaled population counts from one to 10,000. If we overlay world pop, you have uh, the world pop estimates again in the same colors. So these stacked rasters that are in a native or a common reference geographic reference system or coordinate system in a common grid will make doing rapid analysis of population area counts for any uh, practitioner uh, who is familiar with geographic information systems or geospatial scripting and say R or Python much easier um, than just the native pop grid viewer. These are the references from my talk today. Please feel free to reach out to me. My email address is cascade at season.columbia.edu. I'm happy to speak with anyone who is here today at the webinar or later on, anyone watching it. I'm more than happy to discuss which gridded population data set or data sets may be best for your uses and even help you develop your analysis. Thank you for your time. Really appreciate it. As a reminder, here is the contact information for myself, Thomas, and Cascade. You can find all the information about the training, including links to download the materials from the training website shown here. And do please check out the many other trainings we have available on the RSET website listed here. We also encourage you to follow us on Twitter to stay informed about upcoming trainings, as well as SDG-related events and activities. As part of part three on February 10th, we will cover a number of use cases from the national and city level, demonstrating how city and national level governments are leveraging Earth observations to calculate SDG 11 indicators such as sustainable urbanization, open spaces for public use, and mean annual levels of fine particulate matter in cities. Thank you very much. And we will now go to our Q&A session. Great, thanks again, everyone. So um, we will now share uh, the document where we can look fantastic. So we have your questions and we've already started providing some responses. Uh, so we'll, look with, we'll try to address all questions today, but if we don't have a chance to get to some of the questions, we'll make sure that um, we follow up and provide responses to these questions and then share them uh, with you along with all other training material. So let's go to question one. How do you normalize unified territorial units between different countries, which may have very different names to call their administrational units? And so there is an answer already there. We can keep the original administrative units. The only requirement is that the administrative information covers the full territory of analysis. How does your model deal with human mobility, such as moving from one city to another or from different census units within the same city? This is particularly challenging in developing countries which are experiencing a fast urbanization rate while census are taking place every uh, several years. Uh, so perhaps we can go to our colleagues at uh, the Joint Research Center, Pietro or Thomas. Would one of you like to respond to that? 
Yes, uh, thank you. Um, Archie, I can I can uh, take up uh, this this question. So this is this is really one of the, the strong limitations of uh, the pr approaches and and all the data we we're dealing with here. Also, the, uh, with what uh, was uh, presented by Cascade, all the data on population that we are making use of are relying on sensors. And in the best of cases, this is done every ten years. So if we have uh, larger population movements uh, happening in between, they are not covered. So we have to try to, to find then uh, other solution. Uh, one option is to, to do micro sensors um, in those areas where we had those changes and try to project this then to larger areas or the entire countries. But this is of course uh, creating then uh, more uh, instability in, in the system. So um, it's not obvious to, to uh, get out such uh, migration effect. And that's also a big problem uh, in developing countries where very often the census is not uh, taking place uh, so frequently. So there are, there's uh, a number of countries where we didn't have census for more than 20 years. Thank you, Thomas. The following question was the elaboration of slide 35 on access to green in urban centers part of a publication, is it possible to share the reference? And so we have already included the reference there. Uh, so you, and uh, I think, yep, so you can look that up. We'll go to the following question. Can these rasters be incorporated with OpenStreetMap uh, to perform service area analysis for transit systems? So we have a response here that yes, indeed, the degree of urbanization is a georeference product and as such it can be combined with OpenStreetMap data. However, it is important to remember that the degree of urbanization is produced always at a special resolution of one square kilometer. And so this can limit some applications that are focused at a very local level. We will go to the following question. Is it possible to classify informal settlements? And let me invite colleagues from the panel to take this on. So let's let's go back to you, Thomas, first, and then perhaps if someone else from the panel wants, wants to contribute as well. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, of course, um, this, this degree of urbanization is um, made to classify entire settlements uh, into uh, the different classes of uh, cities, uh, towns, uh, villages, etc. It does not allow really to, to uh, differentiate with different uh, usages uh, within a city, so uh, informal settlements, slums, versus uh, uh, formal residential areas or industrial complexes. This is not uh, the task of uh, this method. It is just looking at the population densities. Of course, uh, population densities in, in slum areas are often very high, but uh, then they, they are, um, what happens is they would be included mostly into the, the uh, dense uh, cities, urban center of, of this classification, but, but not more. Um, I put there a reference to, to other um, remote sensing techniques that can be used with the same input data that we use for the build-up mapping then uh, to come up with uh, some classification of uh, informal settlements and, and so on. Thank you. We, we move to the next question. Does the EO toolkit also provide a platform to customize classification of satellite data using Python or R libraries? So as, as noted here, so the toolkit is a knowledge resource, so it provides a number of tools that can then be accessed. So it points to the original locations of the tools where then the data can be found, visualized, and analyzed. And so we do invite you to investigate and see, um, to investigate each of the tools and see whether um, this is applicable, what you're requesting here. And so we have an example here, the um, global human settlement layer tools are mostly provided as compiled programs, but we will also start providing source codes in the future, that's from our uh, Joint Research Center colleagues. Let's go to the following question, question seven. So which would be the most appropriate pop grid data sets for local and regional analysis? 
Cascade, would you like to take this, please? Yeah, I um, <clears throat> put two links in there. Um, but the the consensus right now is that it really depends on your specific use case and the question that you're uh, chasing. Um, so I put two papers and I'm going to add one more in there that really walk through the different modeling uh, techniques and provide much more detailed overview of helping end users choose which graded population data set may be best for them. So I highly recommend this no leaving uh, no one left off the map guide. Um, and the second recommendation, um, depending on your use case, is to calculate your uh, population estimate with a few of the graded population data sets so that you have a range estimation. Um, but really, it's it's uh, use, use specific, unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you, Cascade. And I think I, I will also add a link to a story map that is based on one of the publication by Dana Thompson and, and all. And I think that may also be an additional um, useful resource. So thank you for that. Um, wonderful. Let's go to the next question. Um, in assessing urban heat island effect in urban areas, can slums be classified as potential heat islands? Is urban heat island effect an urban disaster? Would somebody from the panel like to take this answer? Yeah, I, I start again because I put in uh, the, what, what is uh, written, written there, then uh, the others can, can come in. Um, I, I gave uh, here the example of Europe, where in the past we had a number of uh, heat waves that, that uh, were in those respective years killing more people uh, than, than other natural disasters in, in the country. So I remember a um, strong heat wave uh, in, in uh, France and, and Central Europe. Um, so it, most of the people were dying in urban areas because people didn't have uh, access to, to green spaces. Uh, it was difficult for elderly people to, to uh, get to shaded places, etc. So I think it is definitely an urban disaster and uh, as such can be addressed. But um, I feel out that um, the, the slums are per se heat islands. So the, the heat islands, I think, are created uh, in, in, to a larger extent. And then it depends also a lot on, on the, the construction of uh, slum areas, informal areas, and uh, the location where they are. But uh, I, I think I heard uh, Dennis, maybe he can come in here. Thank you, Thomas. Let's go to Dennis or Cascade, whoever else wants to contribute, please. I can, this is Cascade here. Um, so in terms of the urban heat island effect, uh, in terms of uh, measuring it within cities around the planet, I'll post uh, two data sets that have, or one data set that has attempted to do this. Um, but in terms of heat health impacts, there are no uh, two meter air temperature data sets for the planet that can resolve that at the neighborhood scale. Um, and it's something that I know NASA, the World Meteorological Organization, um, and others are working on um, using new satellites uh, to measure two meter air temperatures at finer spatial resolutions. But it really is a, a difficult challenge for which we don't have uh, the data to measure, um, both slum area mapping at a global scale and um, two meter temperature and humidity combinations. Great, thank you, Cascade. We will go to the following question. Uh, I would like to know if we can use hexagons as units for analyzing urban areas and territories within the tools mentioned today. Do they have to be one kilometer area is the question. This is an interesting proposal that we were discussing also when developing the method. I think this is the response was coming from uh, our uh, JRC colleagues, so perhaps one of you would like to take this? Yes, I, I, can, uh, I can jump in again. Um, yeah, it, it, indeed, um, we, we, we would like to still experiment with uh, using hexagons. Uh, from, from the theory and the mathematics behind, uh, it's indeed important to stick to the one square kilometer resolution, but uh, it doesn't have to be uh, 
square as we are using now and as we most of us are used to it could also be hexagons um, in the end we we didn't uh, pursue this road because uh, working with uh, hexagons is uh, still uh, not so so widely widely used and uh, we want to to uh, not uh, scare people by coming up with uh, such more complicated uh, complex uh, method to, to work with but um, i think it, it has big potential because if you look at our urban areas based on one kilometer square uh, grids now they they are, come very edgy so if you have um, hexagons uh, it, it may look uh, much uh, much more much closer to reality thank you thomas we can go to the following question under types of built up slide number 18 what criteria is used to classify the built-up areas into residential and non-residential some cities have a substantial amount of urban population in informal settlements slums others hardly have defined urban planning and you find residential factories warehouses and other commercial entities are found in the same neighborhood and so we have an answer here uh, in that the classification of residential versus non-residential areas is mostly based on the size of building complexes. It is mapping mostly larger industrial buildings and complexes. Smaller non-residential areas might not be detected. Anybody else uh, wants to, to complement or add to this answer? Yes, RG, I can I can uh, add yes. to this that uh, for us um, we, we we are aware of those limitations. So that what was described earlier, this this mix of uh, residential, small uh, factories, uh, some shops, this these settings are currently not covered, and it would be classified uh, by this approach as residential areas. But uh, here it's important to understand also our, our use case for this because this built up uh, data are then used for the population disaggregation. And uh, what we want to avoid is that we put a lot of uh, residential population in those industrial areas. So while it might still be okay that they live in, uh, that there's people distributed in the buildings in this mixed uh, environment, we want to avoid that uh, there's a lot of uh, residential population put in industrial buildings where they usually don't live. Um, so that is where we are already uh, quite happy that we came up with a stable global approach to come up at least with uh, the large non-residential areas. Great, thank you. Uh, we'll go to the next uh, question, question number 11. How demanding is the pop grid viewer in terms of data transfer speed or other PC requirements? Cascade, would you like to, to respond to that, please? Yes, thank you. Um, and generally, it's very fast. Um, and it works across you know, slow and fast bandwidth internet connections. Um, because most of the calculate or all the calculations happen on the back end. Right now, if you want to upload a custom geography, right, I believe it can only handle one polygon in your shapefile. Um, but more features, we expect to add more features in the future. Thank you. Great, thank you. A couple of additional questions. Uh, so the next question is, how can I use this mapping tool for urban liability mapping at the block or town level? And I suspect that they are referring to, to the pop grid viewer, but potentially a different mapping tool as well. So can Cascade or Thomas, one of you, Take that question, please. Cascade, if we're referring to the pop grid viewer. Um, right now, the pop grid viewer uh, primarily just contains or only contains population density estimates, um, which do, depending on the locale in question, relate to livability. Um, but in terms of like, pop uh, block level mapping and comparative mapping, uh, that's not possible because the gridded population data sets in the pop grid viewer tend to be at uh, one kilometer spatial resolution, which is uh, fairly coarse for block level mapping. 
However, I think Thomas can speak to this regarding the global human settlement layer, which has a lot of auxiliary data products uh, with it. Yeah, uh, thank you. Well, I think uh, to, to um, come up with information about urban uh, livability, especially at the, at the block and town level, uh, it is important to, to use the information that we are providing um, basically as, as only one ingredient. So our, our core uh, ingredients are uh, the, um, the built up areas and uh, the population. Um, but for, for livability, you may want to combine it then with, with other information. So uh, again, from Earth observation, you can derive information about uh, greenness. So if you combine those, those three already, you can start analysis uh, like how many people are living in the vicinity of larger uh, green, green areas in the city. So uh, that could be one example of how, how things could be done to come up with, with urban livability. Um, the important thing really is, is to, to combine different data sets and not only use Earth observation data and stick to that, but see also if, if there is other information available, maybe coming from the census, uh, that can help you to, to come up uh, with some uh, indicators of urban livability. Great, thank you both. Let's go to question. 13. Even though there is a rapid increase of population in the developing countries, which gives rise to so many challenges to the population, such as unemployment, high depends on agriculture, in which way should be appropriate to enhance the problems using remote sensing and GIS? RG, I, I understand this question, how we can uh, support solving those uh, problems uh, mm -hmm. using uh, remote sensing and, and GIS. And um, if that is uh, the, the question, then I think uh, I've basically uh, previously given already the answer that um, we, we can extract a lot of information from Earth observation data on the, the size and density of houses on uh, on the greenness, um, on on the the road network, etc. But that should then also be combined with with other openly information that that uh, can help solve uh, certain certain issues. So I think uh, we 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 still underexploit a lot the the value of uh, geographic information in general and Earth observation in particular. If we combine those those sources, uh, we, we can still generate a lot of uh, new information. That thank you very much. Solving, yeah. Sure. Yes, thank you, Thomas. And, and you know, I'll add to that that as you may have seen already, the toolkit shares or has a number of filters that the different data and tools can be categorized by. And so you can already have uh, an idea if you're trying to identify what data sets can be used as proxies or help you derive information on access to public transport or on uh, adequate housing and informal settlements, you can filter by those indicators and then you can look at the relevant data sets and tools. Uh, Wonderful. So I think that this is the last question that we have. So with that, we, we want to thank you very much for joining um, today's part two of the three part uh, training. And of course, we invite you and, and, and look forward to seeing you next week for, for part three. So thank you very much, everyone.